Good morning to all the dads and all the men out there. We just want to take this opportunity to wish you such an awesome Father's Day. And I just want to remind you, Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but lead them and admonish them in the goodness and the faithfulness of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as you celebrate this day, let's reflect on our Heavenly Father and how awesome and wonderful He is. And let's strive and do our best to be a blessing to those around us. We love you, we appreciate you, and we're praying for you today. You know, Jesus was the expression of a good shepherd, someone who could lead and guide and protect and help and impart. And fathers too have been given the challenge and the task of being the priest of the home, the father of the house, the, the leader of the family, the leader of the nations. And so whether you're a father impacting a family or a leader impacting an organization, your area of influence is so powerful. And you've been anointed in that specific area to be an influence, to be a guide, to be looked up to and to be cherished by those around you. It's an honor to have a father in the home, in the house and in the church who can stand up to the word of God. It takes courage, it takes boldness. And Joshua 1.8 says that take courage, be bold, have courage, be bold, continue to do the things that God has called you to do. And so as, as you stand in your office as father, as leader, we applaud you because it's not an easy task. And those who have stood up to the plate, we say thank you. And we follow you and we honor you and we actually just wish you a wonderful Father's Day in everything and in every area of your life. And so as the father of Raymond South Coast Family Church, I'm so proud of all our children, all the congregation, everybody who serves, our leaders. And I'm especially proud of my own two boys and my daughter and my grandchildren. So we celebrate together and let's continue to love each other and make a difference wherever we can. We love you. God bless you. Have a beautiful and fantastic day. And we just want to say to the father of our house, we love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you for your leadership, your sacrifice, and everything that you do for the sake of the church. And I can honestly say that you're a father that many people would love to have in their lives. And thank you for that. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great day. We love you. Bye. Rama South Coast Family Church, it's so good to be in your homes once again. And as we just take an opportunity to just get into an attitude of worship today, I just want to encourage you as to all the different ways in which we can praise and worship the Lord. There are many different ways that we approach God, and in so many aspects, the Bible expresses in, um, worshiping God in different ways. And one way is to bow down and worship Him. Another way is to lay prostrate before Him. To dance and to sing. To exhort by pushing His name up and elevating His name and, and encouraging each other in the Lord. Serving is a way that we worship God. And giving is another way that we worship God. But today I want to say that there's a way that we can worship the Lord by virtue of declaring what we actually believe. Decla declaring is a solemn but serious yet emphatic manner in which we say something. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's a, it's a command, it's an urgency, it's an admonition to spend time and declaring what you actually believe. And as you declare your confession of faith by virtue of singing it to the Lord, you make God's heart expand and, and proud of you. As you make bold, bold statements of His word of exaltation, of victory and favor, by declaring His grace, speaking words of courage and triumph, as we do this, we bring remembrance 
of the great things that God has done for us and, what, and that which He has promised us to do. And when you start to declare those words, God rises up to His word and He starts to perform it in your life. And so today as you, as you enter into a time of praise and worship, I want to encourage you. Father God, we worship you today, making songs of declaration and songs of love toward you. Allow us to, to glorify your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. Is this song coming? 
Don't you worry, don't you worry, child Oh, heaven's got a plan for you Don't you worry, don't you worry, child You see, heaven's got a plan for you Oh, don't you worry, don't you worry, child Oh, heaven's got a plan for you Don't you worry, don't you worry now Oh, heaven's got a plan for you Spirits out, rushing wind Fire of God, fall within Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray As we repent, turn from sin Revival embers smoldering Breath of God, fan us into flame We need a fresh wind The fragrance of heaven Pour your spirit out Pour your spirit out For hearts that
Good morning. Welcome to Rhema South Coast Family Church, and we are so glad that we can be in your home this morning as we share the word, as we grow together. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for your living word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into truth. And we're so amazed by your grace today. As we study your word, thank you that you'll speak to our hearts, you'll renew our minds, and we'll continue to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're really excited. We're in our series called Brand New, and we're studying the book of Revelation. And today's subtitle, we're going to be looking at the seven trumpets. It's God's greatest desire that we as his children know Jesus, become acquainted with him, so that we walk and live in his love and his grace. This is what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So we see here Paul speaks about the resurrection, but he also talks about the cost of walking in that, that sometimes there is this element of suffering, there is this element of needing to conform to his death where we're going through things in the flesh so that we can grow in the spirit. We're studying the book of Revelation with that perspective so that we can continue to follow Jesus, that our lives are full, and that we're prepared for Christ's eventual return. To date, we have been looking at different areas of Revelation. Revelation 1, we saw who and and what and the magnificence of Jesus. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we looked at the letters to the seven churches. And then from chapter 4, we saw that the rapture had taken place and that now we were starting to look at the way things would unfold, firstly in the dispensation of grace, but then as God starts to wrap up his end time purpose and plan for the world. Please remember that as we now are looking, we're in sort of the middle of the great tribulation, the season of grace is coming to an end, and really it's a time of terror and a time of judgment upon the earth. But the church has already been caught up into heaven. The rapture has taken place. And here we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, from verses 15 through to verse 18, the Apostle Paul actually speaks about this. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be always with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So remember, The words of God and an understanding of revelation, while it might bring fear to those who don't know Jesus, it brings comfort and strength to those who know Jesus. Now this word caught up here in verse 17 is the Greek word hapatsio, and it actually means to catch away forcefully, to pluck or to pull something up. And it's actually where we get our word, the rapture. It actually means to be caught up. And we see examples of this happening either by the power of the Holy Spirit or by the ministering angels in Acts 8 verse 39 where the the Spirit of God caught Philip up and he was translated. And again in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 2 and 4. And we'll look at it later on in Revelation chapter 12. So remember, here we are in Revelations 5, and look what verse 11 and 12 says. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, which is 100 million, and thousands of thousands. So it was even more than just 100 million. So we see the church had been raptured, 
And we see them saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and blessing. So it's important to remember, in this book of Revelation, we see a combination of symbolism, literal events, and spiritual warfare happening in the heavenlies. And so we need wisdom and discernment to know which of these is being spoken of at a particular time. And the honest truth is we don't always know. We only see through a glass darkly. Then we need to remember that we have both past, present, and future things happening, sometimes even simultaneously. And then thirdly, that we have things happening now, even in the world today, which are actually signs or precursors of that which will intensify and become more real and, and more serious as we enter in to the end of days, moving into the tribulation, which are the things we're looking at currently. Now, last week we saw the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, the only one who was worthy to open the scroll and release the seals, release the seventh seal, which was the seven trumpets of God's judgment. So over the next three weeks, we'll be studying chapters 8 through chapters 12 of the book of Revelation. And I want to encourage you to take time over these weeks to read those chapters even several times. Each trumpet pronounces a different judgment upon the earth similar to the 12 plagues that were sent to the nation of Egypt when they would not release God's people during this great tribulation. And after each trumpet, the severity of the, of the, of the judgment intensifies and becomes more serious. Remember that these trumpets are God's response to the prayers of the saints praying to the Heavenly Father, which were kept in those jars and, and were an incense in Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11, and again here in Revelation 8, verses 4 to 6. Let's take a look at it again just one more time. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So let's take a look at the first trumpet. We see the vegetation of the world is struck. Revelation 8 and verse 7. It says, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second trumpet, we see the seas are struck. In Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9, Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third trumpet, the waters are struck. In Revelation 8, verses 10 and 11, it says, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died, many men died from the water, because it was made bitter. And then we see the fourth trumpet where the heavens are affected in verses 12 of Revelation 8. It says, Then a fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Now notice something incredible, that after the first four trumpets have blown and sounded, there's another brief pause before the final three trumpets are blown. And we see what's happening as a result of this in verse 13. 
It says in verse 13, And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. This displays for you and I, and clearly shows that God once again wants to display His grace and mercy even in the midst of His judgment. It's an addition, additional call and warning to the inhabitants of the earth and to the people on the earth, giving them an opportunity to turn to Jesus and be saved. People often think that God brings judgment because He likes to be fierce and He likes to judge. But the reality is, it is because He is a just and a fair God. And notice that he always gives us a way out. That's his heart. He always wants to provide a way of escape. And then we see after this interlude that the balance of the three trumpets will begin to sound. And actually, things are ramped up and even start to get worse. We see the sounding of the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. Now, we're not going to read that for ourselves today, but notice two very important things. In verse 1, most scholars agree that this is a manifestation of a demonic being or even Satan himself that is released. In verse 2, the bottomless pit is opened, which speaks about literally hell is released on the earth. And it's a picture of this, of this uh, bottomless pit, which is actually a reservoir of evil. And it has been the prison and will be the prison for demons up till now. But it will also be where Satan will be bound during Christ's millennial reign here on earth. The smoke spoken of during this fifth trumpet speaks of the intensified deception that will be rampant on the earth because of the demons that are released. And there's a great torment that come upon the people of the earth that have rejected God. They are tormented, but no one is killed. How terrible is that? What, what a sad time of torture, destruction, and pain. But remember, God's 144,000 Jewish evangelists are not touched by these at all because they have the seal of God's protection on their foreheads. Another amazing, beautiful picture of the reality of God's protection and His Word working in the lives of His people, just like declared in Psalm 91. At the close of this, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13, we see the angels sounding the sixth trumpet of God's judgment. This trumpet brings an astonishing amount of death and an, and an incredibly disturbing response from those on the earth. With the sixth trumpet, the four angels are released along with an army of 200 million probably demonic forces and one third of the people on the earth are killed a time unlike any witnessed in human history before. What a mind-blowing response of the majority of the people who have survived up to now in this period, they still reject Jesus. They still refuse to acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior. Look what it says here in Revelations 9, verses 20 and 21. It says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of their works, of their hands, they sh that they should not worship demons, should not worship idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and that they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So instead of turning to God in repentance, their defiance grows even stronger. It's such an important lesson to you and I even today 
that we're to continue to protect our hearts and remain in the word because it's the word of God that is the anchor of the soul and causes us to remain a people of compassion because of the work of the Holy Spirit and God's love in our lives. You see, the heart of man can grow so hard that even during a great tragedy and even death, we can still refuse to turn from our sin and run to God. And so we need to remember that as we keep looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our, of our faith will continue to receive his love, walk in his favor, and experience his grace sustaining our lives. Now we're going to see the seventh trumpet is about to sound. But notice something quite interesting, that the seventh trumpet only sounds in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15. That's basically one and a half chapters or nearly two chapters down the line. And so we're going to look at the seventh trumpet next week. Because before the blowing of the seventh and final trumpet of God's judgment, there's an interlude and two incredible events take place. Chapter 10 and chapter 11 speak of these. Let's look firstly today at Revelation chapter 10. Revelation 10 is a very real reminder to us of God's inc incredible character that is unchanging and that his spoken and written word is everlasting and trustworthy. What a comfort to the hearts of every person who is a Christian today. We can still trust and rely on the word of God because the word of God is true. If, you're a Christ, if you are in Christ today and you fill your life with God's word, not only do you not need to fear, but you can walk in confidence and courage because of the life of the Holy Spirit working in your heart. So let's dig into this right now. In Revelation chapter 10, in the first three verses, it's, it describes to us the following. It says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Now, some scholars believe this is actually Jesus Christ. But I believe, and, and many scholars agree with me, that this is actually one of the mighty archangels, perhaps Michael or Gabriel, that manifest themselves symbolically as a type of Christ representing and symbolizing Christ because he is Christ's representative. And this angel reflects the glory of God, the glory of Jesus, and his authority and his attributes. You see, his feet stand on both land and sea, and it speaks to you and I of, of Christ's divine sovereignty, his authority, and his control in the matters of God's judgment. Verse 2 says that he had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. This special envoy of God speaks about the mission of the church during the great tribulation. We see as well that because of this, there's an increased revelation of the word. Another reminder to you and I of the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ and building our lives on the firm foundation of God's word. Do you remember when Jesus spoke about the parable of the two men who built their homes? One built their home on the sand and one built their home on the rock. And when the storms beat and the, and the rain fell and the wind blew, the house that was built on sand fell and collapsed. But the house built on the rock, which is Jesus, the word of God, it stood firm despite the trials, the storms, and the winds that blew. This message is for the whole world and whoever will listen. In Revelations 10, 
verse 4 to 7, it continues and it says, Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, speaking about John, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them down. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and they should be and that there should be no delay any longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Wow, what an incredible uh, experience that's going on that John saw. And so we see from this that the whole counsel of God, his plan, and the depth of his wisdom, his glory, and his creativity has still not been completely revealed. How many of you know his glory and his power and his majesty never come to an end? And so it's a picture to you and I. Man, we ain't seen nothing yet. God is just getting started. But there's also much that he wants us to know and understand. Number one, the raised hand of the angel speaks about God's unbreakable oath to mankind. The delay no longer speaks about the reality that God's purpose is about to be fulfilled once and for all. And thirdly, we, we see it speaking about the mystery of God which is a reference to God's redemption plan that has already started unfolding but is about to be completed in these final events leading up to Revelation chapter 19. Here, God says to John, you've seen this, but don't write down what you've seen and heard. There's a very important perspective for you and I to grasp in this moment. Firstly, we need to realize today that God alone knows everything which is occurring today and in the future. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, there is nothing hidden from the presence of God. And so that's a comfort, but it's also a warning for you and I to never get into a place where we think that we know everything. We should never claim that we know everything, and we should recognize that we don't know everything, and we only know the things that God has revealed to us in his word and through his spirit. So whether it comes to the end times or whether it comes to any other subject, we're to remain humble before God. We're, we're to remain sensitive, and we're to keep trusting the Lord. Things might look one way in the natural but in the spiritual, God knows what's going on. And if we keep our hearts trusting before God, he'll be able to reveal the things we need to know. So we remain humble, trusting God, and having grace and faith every day to serve Jesus. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. These, this passage in Revelation reminds us of the following. A, God is restraining the influence of evil for a better time. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse, two and, uh, verse 7 tells us that. Number one, up until now he's held back his judgment, but he won't continue to do that. Revelation 7 verses 1 to 3. And thirdly, we see that God has exhibited incredible patience for the sake of salvation and people coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verses 9. But all of this points to the fact that while God held back, while God restrained, but while God experienced, uh, exhibited patience, he will not always do so. It says that there will be no more delays and his justice will be seen. Church, let's remember that we need to continue being witnesses. We need to continue to share the love of Christ with others every day in the best way we know how. 
Revelation chapter 10, verses 8, it continues. And in verse 8 to 11, it says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. And so I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. This little book represents the message that is to be preached by the church and the two witnesses, which we'll learn about next week in chapter 11, during the time of the Great Tribulation. It speaks about a specific revelation and knowledge of God's word that needs to be released. But as well, it's encourage, an encouragement to the church today and throughout the ages that we are to continue preaching the word of God and specifically the living word. You can't just preach the Logos, you've got to preach the Rhema. You study the Logos, you let it renew your mind, you let it change your life inside, and then you release it as the living word of God. Because notice, it says it was sweet while he ate it, but then it became bitter in his stomach. This speaks about two different areas, and the first one is this, it shows us that the word of God must saturate our whole personality. It must renew our mind, and as God's grace is unfolded, it should release his love in us that brings change, growth, and victory. But the warning is that if we reject his word, judgment will follow. So we need to remember to embrace and make the word part of our lives. The other aspect of this, uh, which is more symbolic, but also practical in its application, is that when we receive the word, we receive it with joy. How many you know the word is like honey? The word is beautiful and it's precious. But the bitter part is this, is that when it becomes part of our lives, very often there's a painful process that we need to go through if the word is going to make a difference, if the word's going to become real and we're going to live it, how many you know there's a suffering in the flesh? And that speaks about the bitterness of the word, that sometimes it's first painful before it's beautiful. And it's an encouragement to you and I that we need to continue to go through God's process and not give up, but persevere until we see the beautiful, wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So in the last bit of time that I have left today, I want to talk to you about five things or five facts about God's Word that we learn from Revelation chapter 10. Here we go. You can jot them down. Number one, Jesus Christ and the Word of God are inseparable. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. In John 1, verses 1 to 5, we're reminded, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Here's the reality. Notice something powerful, that God, the Trinity, were together right at the beginning. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were right there in the beginning, in Genesis, and they created the earth. And here we see them at the end together fulfilling their purpose. Number two, the second thing we learn about God's word here is that God's word is God's will and therefore it carries God's power. When you make it part of you, when you release it out of your mouth, and when you live it, the power of God to fulfill that word is inherent within the word. Number three, we learn from Revelation 10 that it's the Holy Spirit who reveals the word and makes it come alive in our lives. That's why the word of God is so beautiful. It's the Holy Spirit who unlocks the word so it becomes part of us. 
Number four, the fourth promise, we, uh, the fourth thing we see about the Word of God is that the Word of God contains the promises of God. And the promises of God stand firm throughout eternity. They never come to an end. They never fail. And they never limited. And number five, we see today from Revelation chapter 10 that God's Word is always alive, powerful, and speaking. Listen, God's Word speaks. In other words, those voices, the thunderings, the, the still small voice all come down into the reality that God's word carries within it living power to speak and to change things. So here are five things you and I should do with the word. Number one, devote yourself to his word. Number two, read his word for yourself. Don't leave it up to someone else. Number three, don't just read the word, study the word regularly. Number four, don't miss church, if at all you can help it. The local church is the hope of the world. And number five, listen earnestly and obey the word. It will prevail in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your living word. Thank you for speaking to us today. I pray for every person who's listening or watching this today. May their lives be empowered right in this moment. May they have a fresh revelation of Jesus. May they experience the life of your spirit bringing grace to them for whatever they're going to face this week. In Jesus' name, I pray if there's someone listening or watching that has sickness in their body, I pray right now that by the stripes of Jesus, they will receive healing in Jesus' name. And if you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it would be my great privilege to lead you right now in the prayer of salvation. Just pray this out aloud if you have a tugging on your heart. Just be sincere and God will do the rest. It's a prayer we pray from Romans chapter 10. Father, Today I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for my sins and that You raised Him from the dead. I open my heart and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank You for saving me today. Now if you just prayed that prayer, would you please send us a WhatsApp or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray with you. And we'd love to send you a Bible if you don't already have one. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today online. And we hope that the Word of God has made a difference in your life. If you want to know more about Ramah South Coast Family Church, about our mission and our vision, please go to rfcfc.com or send us an email. Perhaps you have a prayer request or a testimony. Send it to us. We'd love to stand with you during this time. And finally, if you'd like to sow finances to support the vision and the mission of our local church, you can find our EFT banking details on our website or send us an email or you can give on the snap scan that's appearing on your screen right now. God bless you. Myself and Pastor Mandy love you. We're praying for you and have a blessed week. And don't forget, you can join us on Thursday night at half past six for a Bible study and communion message. We hope you will. Bye-bye.